have three speakers today, by a four really. Um, the first two are uh, Caroline uh, Micklewright from Exeter and Daniela Nowalski from uh, the RAF, uh, talking about hidden desires, a critical analysis of military leadership. So the same uh, ground rules apply. We'll try and do it for 15 minutes and then we'll let's see if we can get 15 minutes uh, Q&A in. Okay, do you want to go to um, display mode? Yep, no problem. Done. I don't know if Danny managed to explain with all that little bit of faff uh, going on there, but she's had COVID. So yeah. I'm speaking, so you've got me, I'm afraid. Okay. So I'll just set them up. Fab, there we go. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so good morning and um, yeah. Hi, so I'm Caroline McWright and I'm presenting today with Daniela Nowalski from the Tedder Academy of Leadership within the Royal Air Force. Um, I'm a veteran myself. Uh, Danny and I have known each other for about 20 odd years. Um, we're both logistics officers, or we, I was a logistics officer in the Air Force. Danny now works in the reserves. And we've had many conversations over the years about leadership in the Air Force and leadership from a, a female perspective as well, a gender perspective. And uh, we really wanted to look at how we could explore this issue to um, to to see how leadership has been presented in the uh, especially from a female perspective in the Air Force today. So um, just a little bit of context for those of you who don't know much about the Air Force and about the MOD in general. Um, women make up about 11% of the UK regular armed forces today and about 15% of the reserves. When it comes to the Air Force in both the regular and reserves, um, there's more females represented within that service. So there's 15% in the regulars and 22% in the reserves. When you look at the officer figures again, sort of zeroing in a bit further, you see it's even higher with um, RAF officers hitting about the 18% mark in terms of females and about 23 percent in the reserves. So the RAF does have a greater representation of women in its forces, but it's still very much a man's world. And um, you can see that just <laughs> put these pictures together just to sort of give that representation really. And culturally, the Air Force still leans very much back towards World War II and the Battle of Britain. And um, it's still very much part of our the culture and ethos of the organisation and it's still very much a masculine organisation even though there are greater numbers of women um, in the service. So we thought we'd start looking at trying to understand how the RAF is presenting leadership internally and they have an, an air power booklet AP 7001 where which sort of it outlines how leadership should look like within the Royal Air Force. And you can see there that definition of leadership about the projection of character, principles and behaviours that inspire people to succeed, to succeed. And you've got the RAF roundel here as well. <clears throat> and a lot of thought went into this, creating this roundel a couple of years ago and trying to make the language more inclusive in terms of leadership. So trying to get away from those binary masculine masculine ideas of what leadership is and how it should be presented. And you can see that in the um, the choice of the words here, the behaviours on the outer rim, the capacities on the white ring and the principles within the, the core there. And you can see also you've got words like empowering and connecting um, within within the roundel itself. You know, not, not so much about trying to move away from that idea of of delivering and um, focused, but it still does have that 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 masculine dimension, obviously, because it is the military. So you still have that war fighter ethos being coming through. So we started to think about how we could look at this leadership within the military and within the Royal Air Force from a theoretical point of view, and and. I Propose to Danny these ideas, uh, um, theoretical ideas from Deleuze and Derrida, in terms of you know what does the the Air Force and the military really want? Because I feel very much there's a gap between the words that are used sometimes and the reality on the ground in terms of leadership within the organisation. So we looked at Deleuze and thought, well, 
the the Air Force says it has this desire, but but how is that working, and who is it working for when it comes when it comes to talking about leadership? And then to add that critical dimension, I really wanted to look at um, to use Derrida to understand the absence the absent presence. So they present one perspective, but what are they actually? What's behind the story? To look at dig a little bit deeper. So we looked at the official narrative, and you know, as I've explained, the RAF's trying to um, inculcate diversity within to the organisation. It's really putting a lot of effort into recruitment of more diverse groups of people. It holds numerous webinars, conferences, presentations, talks, discussions at station level and across the organisation, trying to to understand how they can be disruptive thinkers. Um, I don't know if you've heard about um, the Astra project. Oh, I'm going on a bit too quick there. Um, the Astra project part of that, which we can discuss later if we have time. But it's all about breaking down barriers to unconscious bias and thought cages and thinking differently, deciding differently in order to lead differently. So this is the official narrative that's come across. And it does have its, its spoken desires. You know, it wants to represent society by gender, across gender and other characteristics. It doesn't have any set targets. The Ministry of Defence did have targets, which um, it failed to meet up until 2020. That was to get 15% of all new recruits into the military to be female. And they also had um, targets as well for increasing diversity across the piece. They failed on, on both counts to meet those targets, but they, were, they weren't too far off it. But the Air Force already had over 15% of its members um, female, so it was trying to hit 20, and it, again, it didn't quite make that. So in practice, what has the Air Force actually done to try to um, address some of the issues it has about female females in the organisation and the leadership that they can actually have the opportunity to, to go on to do. And they have created gender committees, diversity inclusion committees, mentoring programs, and they have a specific mentoring program for females as well. And they're really trying to, to reframe leadership. And at RAF College Cranwell, they take a much more, um, instead of a transactional approach to leadership, they're trying to they're introduce coaching, a coaching style to their leadership training. They've introduced, and a lot of these um, policies across are across um, Defence as well, not just the Royal Air Force, but flexible working, flexible service, wraparound childcare, shared shared maternity leave, and even you know changing how we how women can look in the military from you know no longer having to wear hair in buns, but actually being a bit softer in their approach with wearing ponytails and plaits. But there is a counter narrative to all this, and we've seen that in um, a lot of the reports that have come out in recent years. So we had the House of Commons Defence Committee's report on women in the Air Force, with, sorry, women in the Ministry of Defence and how they get treated and um, bullying and sexual harassment and their lack of promotion and a whole raft of issues. Um, I think the important thing here to note is that we are um, still struggling to get women into the highest ranks. And the the change has is glacial, it's been described as. And there are only, just for example, there are only 14 female aircrew at the rank of wing commander and above in the Royal Air Force, despite female fighter pilots being in the Air Force for over 25 years. So we are, we do have problems and we're not alone in having these kind of problems in the UK military. There are similar issues in the Australian forces, in the American, Canadian, it, it's South African. There continues to be issues surrounding having women in the, the armed forces that the ministries are failing to address. And it has a an impact on 
not just on the ability of women to lead within the organization, but it has an impact on their personal lives as well. So you see that um, just that second to bottom line there, female military leaders are less likely to have children than male leaders. 90% of men at OF5 rank have children compared to only 10% of women at the same rank. So it has an impact beyond the military organization into family life. And the Chief of Defence Staff, the previous Chief of Defence Staff, has actually said that invariably it, this is about a failure of leadership. So understanding all that context, um, Danny and I were trying to understand how we could measure and understand how leadership is presented and portrayed within the Royal Air Force from that female perspective. And one of the ways we thought we could do this was through the social media lens. So the Ministry of Defence and the three services all like to engage with the general public through social media. It's one of the ways they feel they can breach that civil military gap. So we took, um, and originally we were thinking we would follow the senior leadership team within the Royal Air Force to understand how they were engaging with social media, but um, that was quite big. So we focused in on two um, Facebook pages, the RAF College Cranwell Facebook page and the official RAF uh, website. And what I did was I took um, 12 months photographs, just under 12 months photographs that were used at the, on the RAF College Cranwell Facebook page to understand how women were being presented and how women were being presented as leaders through social media. And what was um, interesting and was um, how heavily women were represented in those social media feeds. Despite, as I said, um, 18% of the Royal Air Force being female at the officer level, and bear in mind, Cranwell's where we train officers, um, they were overly represented compared to their actual representation in terms of numbers on the page. So, but they were still only 10% of the photographs were purely women. 43% showed men and women in the photographs and 39% showed men. Um, purely male. And I just thought that was interesting and I wanted to unpick it to understand what the purpose of this was and what effect it was having. Oops, sorry. So this picture um, stood out for, for us and um, it, for, to our knowledge, it's the first time that um, there was a dais full of women for a royal graduation at the RAF College Cranwell and um, what I was really interested in and, and Danny and I discussed is the the comments that were put on to um, the social media in response to the photograph and you see um, I've actually made a bit of a mistake here sorry this this line here love this a dais of hard-working female role models was actually made by a man um, and all the blue um, comments there were made by men and the, the red ones, the iconic, powerful women, very inspirational were by women. So there was a, a very clear difference between um, how women and men were responding to this picture with just the one man making a positive comment. So just to go back into the data a little bit, um, it was, I wanted, well, we wanted to understand how much, not, not just um, what people were saying, but also look, trying to look at that absence, what people weren't saying. And you can see here with the RAF College Facebook page, it has 20,000 followers. And there was only 240 likes when it came to that picture. And, um, but the, the comments were, you know, one third, um, negative, two thirds positive. And on the RAF Facebook page, which also picked up on that particular picture, um, similarly, it had a balance, a more balanced um, comments between negative and positive. And the RAF Facebook page has 700,000 followers and it got, this particular picture got 1.4 thousand likes. So we have, although there's a, there is evidence of people engaging with these pictures, there's a lot more people who don't engage. So that sort of put a bit of a question mark. 
Um, also, there was the negative comments within the REF Facebook page were actually not necessarily about female officers, but about officers in general. So I felt there's almost a class issue going on here, um, you know, calling officers Rodneys, Ruperts, etc. So um, I know my time's nearly up, so I'm going to be really quick, but just draw your attention to the right on to the right, that little conversation that took place there. And you see the, the silencing of discussion, you know, the, the refusal of the individual to engage into the conversation. Um, so very quickly, um, from a Deleuzean perspective, you know, where the desire works, how it works and who it works for. Um, the RAF's desire to increase female recruits has failed. Um, I feel there's a that overpopulating social media with women is actually giving not only giving a false representation of the organisation, but creating a backlash because um, social climate doesn't really allow people to have a, a debate about these issues without you know the cancel culture coming into play. And I think that in a way can actually perpetuate the status quo. And if we look at it from a from Derrida's perspective, the, the identification of the absent present, you have this false narrative, I think, of female empowerment. But that picture of them on the dais as well, it's very much masculine performativity. So it's yes, it's women on the dais, but they're still performing masculine ideas of leadership. So in doing that, are the REF actually reinforcing binary divisions in how females are represented? And what does all this mean in terms of leadership? Thank you. I shall stop sharing. Thanks. Thanks very much, Caroline. It was great. While, uh, while everybody else thinks about what the, the question might be, can I just ask you um, one, which is to think about um, <clears throat> one of the things that is constantly reiterated about the REF is the kind of foundational myth. So all, all countries and organisations have foundational myths. And I think one of the strongest in the RAF is the Battle of Britain. Mm -hmm. So whenever you see the RAF, you always see the Battle of Britain and you always see usually Spitfire pilots, occasionally hurricane pilots. So that's just about it. So that there, there is something in the very foundations, which means when people are, are um, <clears throat> exposed to what the RAF is now, there's quite often a reflection on what it used to be in its greatest heyday. And I wonder whether that that constant reiteration of um, the Battle of Britain is actually part of the problem that you can't get away from the foundational myth. I, I, I think I have to agree with you. And I don't think that's something I saw until I left. Um, it's, it, you know, that distance gives you room to, to think and, and move, move on, doesn't it? And I would agree with you. I think, um, yeah, it, it just smacks of not being able to move forward and look to the future. Mm. And, and whilst it's important to understand the, cult, the sacrifices that took place back then and the, the spirit of um, fighting to, you know, to almost to, not quite to your last man, because that's another part of the myth, isn't it, about how outnumbered yeah. we were. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but um, that, that fighting spirit and that is important to get across, but it doesn't position us well for the future. I yeah. I'd absolutely agree. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Leo, you have a question. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Uh, thanks to Caroline and Daniela. It's a fantastic paper. Really enjoyed it. Um, just to go, I don't know what, I'm just kind of comments really. I don't know if there's a specific, specific question. It's just, I guess, my recent work, I've been looking at the ambulance service, which has got lots of similarities, a uniformed culture, kind of crown badge, uh, traditionally male dominated, but it's, 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 Gender split is now pretty much 50-50. However, the cultural problems are still just as intense. They, they may be changing in certain ways, but you've still got this issue of a kind of a command culture, very poor standards of management and leadership, frankly, right? And very high levels of burnout. You know, the work's challenging and difficult, but it's compounded by a very unpleasant working environment. And your, your discussion of the social media was fascinating because it's very, very similar to what you see in the ambulance and paramedic world where there's this concern among the ranks and he was that rank still being used right about um the, the official social media line and a, of many things and it's not just gender and ethnicity and other things it's a sense that, that, that the official social media story just isn't right it doesn't reflect the realities on on the ground right 
And this critique of the top brass is so similar. I mean, it's interesting with yours because there's that class, explicit class element. There's none of that in the ambulance service as much, right? Because the senior leaders are, are nearly all former paramedics, former NHS types, a few are corporate types, mm -hmm. general managers. But again, they're, they're, held, they're held in a, in a kind of low level of esteem among, among the workforce, right? So you get a very similar kind of dynamic. And I, and I wonder, um, yes, RAF MOD is trying to change, trying to adapt, trying to become more flexible, agile, all the, all the things that it's supposed to do, more, more, more equal, more diverse. But there's this uniformed culture that to me, I think is just fundamental to all of these types of organization where that they're that bit harder to change than other un other organizations, right? So there's that entrenched nature of loyalty, rank, insignia, the symbolism, it's like so heavily infused, right? And um, I wonder if, as, as, so my question, getting my hand the rambling thing, that my, my question, I mean, I, so much resonated with, with what I've looked at, so similar. The question, I guess, is would, would you, how far do you want to take this in terms of maybe outside of leadership and into sociology of work, organizational culture? Because the, the two, there's two separate literatures in a way. And I wonder if a deeper kind of run into kind of organizational culture, uniform culture, things like Lewis Coase's idea of the greedy institution, mm -hmm. one of these things might help you really bring this out. Because I would imagine if, if, you, if, if you increase the ratio improve the ratio of gender split in the organization, I think you'll still have this chronic culture problem. Oh, we would. I, I, I've I got, suspect. I suspect. I've got no doubt about that. So my previous research, I've, I've used the greedy institution, I mean, Koza's work. And, you know, you look outside into um, professions like veterinary surgeons or um, doctors, lawyers, you still see that actually there's more women entering these professions, but the culture hasn't changed. And um, I've no doubt that I, it's quite interesting because I think military personnel, military men and some women are actually scared by the prospect of having more females in the organisation because they think the culture is going to change. But I think it will it will adapt. Yes, but I think the core culture will stay pretty solidly masculine unless there's a, you know, some transformational changes going on. And that is, you know, the same the paramedics that you're looking at. You know they they're um very they are very similar we get a lot of crossover between you know people leaving the military joining the police joining the flyer service looking into paramedics and um they do that because they like the culture they like that military militarization almost of civilian life in a way they can carry it over with them when they move across and it is a it is a social issue you know you get socialized into the military you get socialized to behave this way and your behaviors are um that's what i'm looking for it, as an officer especially you're constantly aware if you've, you've been watched and being judged on your behavior as an officer and if you don't meet those standards then you know you know you won't get on very well within the organization so it's just trying to understand for us how you know, are they are, by by over representing women? You know, are they are, is the Air Force doing any women any favors? Because women are still being expected to behave in a masculine way within the institution. If I can just jump back on that last bit. Can, that, that, can, can we, we uh, sorry, Leo, can we? Sure. Uh, we have five minutes left. Of I wonder course, if we, yeah. just, we just get Victor Perez who has a question, and then if we if that runs out, we'll come back to that point. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you for your presentation. That was really interesting. And I was thinking about the concept of desire. In in the delusion sense, desire is a sort of a striving force, a productive force. So desire produces something. And Deleuze also draws on Spinoza on his idea of desire, of as this sort of affect in which bodies or entities aim to strive for, to stay alive, the, the conatus, as Spinoza says. So I was wondering about uh, this concept and whether you have further reflections about the different currents of desire clashing in this sort of, of environment, because we have the striving force from maybe from the woman's side and also from the institutional side. And both desires produce something and maybe they clash. 
you know, at some point. So do you have any further reflections about that or? And I think that's where the violence comes from. I think when you look within the military culture, um, that, you know, for all the military will say it's a team and um, it prioritizes teamwork and this idea, this concept of the military family and looking after each other. You know, if you look deeper in the House of Commons Select Committee report um, into protecting women in the armed forces, it's it's shocking that today we, we we're still we're dealing with these these things because um, if you're part of a team and you're part of a family, then you shouldn't be well ra raping each other and you shouldn't be. Um, bullying each other and you shouldn't be submitted submitting people to, to sexual harassment and all the awful things that, that have happened within the military and that's that clash happening I think and that's the result of the, these different desires um, playing out and my concern is that because this this uh, need, social need to increase the number of women in the military is being pushed and it's come from society, it's not coming from internal, from the Ministry of Defence. They've never taken change on voluntarily ever when it comes to accepting women into the forces. It's always been forced upon them. And because it's being forced upon them, they're not having a proper discussion about what it means. And they're not addressing people's concerns. And because of that, I think that's the, the, out, the result of that is the, this awful environment and culture, this subculture going on within the organisation. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daniela. Yeah, I was just going to follow up on, on the desire point. You know, you're, you're absolutely right. You, you, Caroline was saying we, we strive for this um, cohesion on the battlefield because at the end of the day, what separates us from all those other services, the the, um, the paramedics and, and whatever, is we do ask you know, the ultimate price of people and we do ask them to go off and fight, which is what we do at the end of the day. But um, that desire for the cohesion, that fighting force on the battlefield is absolutely at odds with the desire for cohesion in the day to day workplace, because we don't ask that of people every day. We are essentially a, you know, a force for, for good. Um, how do you not have that that war fighting that that you know, that softer side in the crew room where we're not manifesting it in inappropriate behaviors towards uh females that are serving because you are so testosterone and so ma male driven in your in your desire for for um for 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 power but um Th th that desire to have more female desires in so many ways can be unpicked here. You, know, you desire to have more females and that female perspective and that female thinking, but then you don't want it when you, you, you've got to ask them to go away, but they've got children or they've got childcare issues or they've got um, menopause issues and all these sort of things. You can't have your, your cake and eat it. And that's the problem that we're in. And, and that will be a fundamental culture change. OK, um, one minute to go. Let me just um, let me just choose masculine dominance to finish this off. So I, w I was reading um, a section of the Astra paper, which I think is the kind of strategic forward looking RAF thing, isn't it, at the moment? And I, and I noticed a, a nice little bit which said one of the desires of the RAF is to have hot water in all its establishments. And I'm thinking so you can waste spend 90 million on a plane which falls off a ship that's not a big problem but trying to have fleet air arm. <laughs> try, <laughs> trying to have hot water yeah in your yeah. in your yeah. offices yeah. is just beyond yeah. them which yeah. I think tells you about where the preferences actually lie and I, I think it's you know, that because we could unpick the RAF infrastructure problems all day it's you know, money devolved to a different organization they fix it on failing but then they're too busy building another runway but that's another yeah. That's another conversation. Yeah, it is. It is. Just, All right. It's people at the end of the day, isn't it? How can yeah. you expect them to lead when they can't have a hot shower? Thank you very much. Oh, great. Great start. Um, OK, thank you very much. Would you take those um, slides uh, down, please? That would be great.